This is CPX number 45, the Lord's Prayer Overview. We are in prayer part 3 of the Catechism of Pope St. Pius X, CPX, page 4749, question and answer number 1 through 10. Merry Christmas. I hope you're still enjoying the Christmas octave if you're watching this series shortly after the upload. Let's begin in prayer. In nomine Patri, Sefiri, et Spiritu Sancti, Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler Spirit, Spirit of Truth, who art present everywhere, and filling all things, treasure of all good and source of all life, come dwell in us, cleanse us, and save us, you who are all good. In nomine Patri, Sefiri, et Spiritu Sancti, Amen. The Lord's Prayer in general. Question number one, which is the most excellent of all vocal prayers? Answer, the most excellent of all vocal prayers is that which Jesus Christ taught us, that is to say, the Our Father. Number two, why is the Our Father the most excellent of all prayers? Answer, the Our Father is the most excellent of all prayers because Jesus Christ himself composed it and taught it to us, because it contains clearly and in a few words all we can hope for from God, and because it is the standard and model of all other prayers. Number three, is the Our Father also the most efficacious of prayers? Answer, yes, it is also the most efficacious of prayers because it is the most acceptable to God, since in it we pray in the very words His divine Son has taught us. Number four, why is the Our Father called the Lord's Prayer? Answer, the Our Father is called the Lord's Prayer precisely because Jesus Christ our Lord has taught it to us with His own lips. Number five, how many petitions are there in the Our Father? Answer, in the Our Father, there are seven petitions preceded by an introduction. Number six, say the Our Father. One, Our Father who art in heaven. Two, hallowed be thy name. Three, thy kingdom come. Four, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Five, give us this day our daily bread. Six, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Seven, and lead us not into temptation. 8. But deliver us from evil. Amen. Number 7. When invoking God in the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, why do we call him our Father? Answer. In the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, we call God our Father to foster confidence in his infinite goodness by the remembrance that we are his children. Number 8. How can we say that we are the children of God? Answer. We are the children of God first because he has created us in his own image and preserves and governs us by his providence. And secondly, because by an act of special benevolence, he has adopted us in baptism as brothers of Jesus Christ and co-heirs with him to eternal glory. Number nine, why do we call God our Father and not my Father? Answer, we call God our Father and not my Father because we are all his children. And hence, we should look on and love one another as brothers and pray for one another. Number ten, God being in every place, why do we say, who art in heaven? Answer, God is in every place, but we say, our Father who art in heaven, to raise our hearts to heaven, where God manifests his glory to his children. Thus are the words of the Holy Pope. Okay, so let's look a little bit deeper at number eight. Pope St. Pius X wrote, quote, We are the children of God first because he has created us in his own image and preserves and governs us by his providence, end quote. So again, how are we made in God's image and likeness? I think it was a church father who said, by having an intellect and will. That is how we are in God's image and likeness. We have an intellect and will. Now that might sound kind of boring. You might be thinking of turning off the video at this point, but here's the thing. Think how no creatures anywhere in the universe except humans and angels have an intellect and a will. Yes, dolphins can figure out puzzles and elephants might seem emotionally distraught if they lose someone in their family. We've seen all those things on YouTube trying to humanize animals. And yes, in some sense, they do have instinct and I'll even grant possibly emotions. But we all know that deep inside, no animal has the free will to the level a human does. And I'll actually give you a proof from this from ultra-liberal philosophies. Think of those extreme environmental groups that use terrorism against, say, lumberjacks or fishers because they claim the latter groups are destroying the earth. One of these groups is called ELF. They're known as the Elves, uh, Earth Liberation Front. Their Wikipedia page says they, quote, use economic sabotage and guerrilla warfare to stop the exploitation and destruction of the environment, end quote. Now, think about it. How many of them believe in evolution? Probably all of them, since they're ultra-liberals, and I don't know if they believe in God or not, probably not, but, and I didn't look at their website, but I'm sure they all believe in evolution because most liberals do in the environmental movement. But wait a minute. If we humans are just other animals killing other animals irresponsibly, well, guess what? That's the survival of the fittest. And in that case, 
we have no moral obligation to be good stewards to other species. I mean, think about it. If you really believed in evolution, you should be able to have every night, say, elephant steaks wrapped in dolphin fins if you want. Why? Because that's survival of the fittest, and there are no moral claims in Darwinian evolution. As Dostoevsky said, if God does not exist, all is permitted. But everybody knows deep inside we're actually called to a higher morality than elephants and dolphins, even though they are never tired of telling us we're the same. Why would they sabotage other humans and attack other humans if they didn't believe that? Not even someone as conservative as me would want to eat elephant steaks wrapped in dolphin fins. Oh, and by the way, your utensil in this scenario is, of course, a rhinoceros horn. I don't mean to just be obnoxious. My point is, we know we're called to something more than other animals that kill each other. And sometimes, yeah, animals will even kill each other for sport. I actually think that's part of the fall, but that's for a different CPX. The point is we have a higher morality coming from our intellect and will, and even liberal atheists will hesitantly admit this. Otherwise, they wouldn't do eco-terrorism. They wouldn't spike trees and forests. They wouldn't sink whaling boats in the Pacific if they really believed in exclusively survival of the fittest. They know we humans, deep inside, they know we humans have an intellect and will unlike any other creature. But now let's expand beyond just the Pacific Ocean and this earth. Now look at the entire universe and think, what is the chance a creature like me, like you, exists amidst this vast expanse of the universe? I mean, what are the chances you exist with your intellect and your will, and probably five senses working and probably 10 fingers and probably a family, what are the chances you exist in the size of the universe? I mean, they say there's over a hundred billion galaxies and each one of those galaxies has over a hundred billion stars. And you're on a planet in one of those galaxies that happens to be the only one they ever found life on? What is the chance that when your parents united, you would come about as you are considering the genetic permutations that were possible, really just short of infinite, really? So yeah. God is your father and God loves you enough to make you like him with intellect and will, just like the angels. But even more than that, what's the chances you would be you? Now, let's shift gears a little bit. In another sense, it takes more than just being a creature of God with an intellect to truly call God father. Here's where baptism comes in. I believe the church fathers teach that everyone is born in God's image, but only baptism restores his likeness. Image and likeness again. You're born in his image, but only baptism restores that likeness. Pope St. Pius X said in number eight today, and this is where we really look at what it means to be a son or daughter of God, quote, Secondly, because by an act of special benevolence, God has adopted us in baptism as brothers of Jesus Christ and co-heirs with him to eternal glory, close quote. So you see that level of becoming a son or daughter of God, that only happens at baptism. That's not just enough to be a creature with intellect and will. Now, when I entered seminary, this shows you how little catechesis I had entering seminary. I really thought that what made you saved is accepting Jesus and receiving the Eucharist. Not a bad start, but I didn't really understand. No, it's baptism. You really become a son of God at baptism because of the applications of the merits of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that happens at baptism. And of course, you do need faith in Jesus Christ as your God and your Savior to be saved also. But that was supplied in proxy by your sponsors at that point. So someone had to have faith, of course. But even if you were baptized, say, by a Jewish nurse and then died 10 minutes later, as long as she intended what the church did, baptism is so powerful that you die a son or daughter of God, even 10 minutes after baptism, even if it wasn't a Christian who did that, you are still a son or daughter of God. And so what I didn't get entering seminary is that it is truly baptism that is the day of your salvation. That's the day you could say you were saved. That's the day the Trinity began to live in you. One of the church fathers even goes so far as to say, before your baptism as a baby, you are a tabernacle of Satan, and then right after baptism, you are a tabernacle of God. Now, if you meet an honest Muslim today and you say, is God your father? Of course, they will say no. And that's because they believe God to be too almighty and transcendent for games like that. But I bet if you ask a Hindu or a Buddhist, at least maybe a lightweight American Hindu or a lightweight American Buddhist, if you ask a typical American who just dabbles in spirituality, if every person of every religion is a son of God, even before baptism, of course they're going to say yes. That's because religion has become so shallow that basically everyone on the planet is a little bit like a universalist Unitarian across the globe. 
And maybe that's because after two world wars, people don't like the idea of excluding others. I get it. But let's look at this historically before I just kind of like hammer it home dogmatically. I just want you to think historically so you don't think I'm making this stuff up, stuff up or being an extremist. If you were to study all these ancient Near East texts, if you were to study religion in, in really ancient cultures, you will not find any of these religions calling God their father. You just won't find it. So like imagine a pagan in Rome or a pagan in Greece first, first hearing of Christianity. Imagine they meet an apostle. If an apostle had said to a pagan before explaining there was only one God and that was Jesus, if an apostle had just said to a pagan, you can become a son of God, he'd be like, what, like Hercules, the son of Jupiter? No, no, that's crazy. Only superheroes are sons of God. You know, I'm just this, they would, he would hear that and he said, no, I'm just this thing with poop in my guts that comes out when I die. You see, normal people back then, when they actually had some sense of the transcendent, they would never claim they were children of God. That would even kind of push against a Roman pagan sense of piety. You see, this idea of being a son or daughter of God is really new in Christianity. In most religions, they rightly understood God was so transcendent that we would never dare to bring him to our level. Even adherence to false religions would never be so impious, and that's, by the way, the correct pronunciation of the opposite of pious, would never be so impious as to claim they were children of God. See, piety actually mattered to these Roman pagans and these Greek pagans, and in some sense, even modern Hindus. I've been to India twice. Well, here's where Christianity is so astonishing, that there is a God, and he's only one, and yes, he is so infinite and transcendent, but even despite that, he wants to call you his son or his daughter. That's outrageous to someone with a real sense of piety who isn't into this like shallow American universalist Unitarianism. And we are made sons and daughters of God in baptism. Have you ever thanked God for that, considering how many people in the history of the world have taken religion seriously and didn't know they could become a son or daughter of God and maybe literally couldn't if they were born before Christ? So, you know, in some sense, I don't blame modern Muslims or ancient Muslims for never daring to call God Father. Because without baptism, they aren't. You see, before my baptism, I was not enough like God to call God my Father. I mean, what's the son of a giraffe? A giraffe. What's the son of an aardvark? An aardvark. What is a son of God? Yikes, we really shouldn't trample in that direction without fear, awe, wonder, and trembling. Really, do you see why you shouldn't dare to call yourself a child of God? And there is exactly the word we use in the liturgy from the very earliest days. Probably the Romans in the catacombs, right before saying, Our Father, they would say, We dare to say, Audemus dicere pater noster. We dare to say, Our Father. So my point is, no world religion would ever be shallow enough to call the Almighty God of the universe my Father or our Father. That is what's so radical about Jesus' death, that he gave us the power to become sons of God, as it says in John chapter 1. Even do a word search in the Old Testament of the Jews calling God Father. I think you'll only find about two or three times in the entire Old Testament where God calls himself the Father of a Jew. Because who would dare call Yahweh Father? God had to maintain his transcendence lest the Jews see him as, say, one of the Canaanite gods here on earth. But the reality for us Christians is this. If you are baptized, you are truly a son or daughter of God. Yesterday's lesson in the traditional Latin Mass of the Sunday in the octave of Christmas, St. Paul tells us this, quote, I mean that the heir, H-E-I-R, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Close quote. Finally, let's close with this in your imagination. Imagine being a Greek pagan who only knew of someone like an imaginary character like Hercules being able to be called a son of God. 
and all you personally know 2,000 years ago is slavery to your passions. Or maybe you're literally a slave in Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey, ironically now Muslim as we talk about slavery to a god who's not our father. But anyway, go back 2,000 years and imagine, pretend you are a first-century pagan slave in Galatia who just heard that reading. But right before that, the Apostle Paul showed up and taught you two amazing things. One, there is only one God. And two, you can be not just his slave, but his son. That would have blown your mind. Imagine how unreal that would have sounded way back then, way back before we were so numbed by this shallow American theology. Oh, we're all children of God, no matter what you've done and who you are and what your religion is. Before all of that shallowness entered into our brains, and again, there's a little truth to the fact we're all sons and daughters of God by the very fact we're creatures dependent on his providence, as I explained in the first half of this video. But besides that, that was the first part of number eight. As we look at the second half of number eight, the importance of baptism, the reality is this. If you are baptized, you are truly a son or daughter of the infinite God of the universe. By no merit of your own, but by the merits of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ applied to you in the unmerited act of baptism. So we'll close with this. If you're not baptized, get baptized. If you are a son or daughter of God, then go act like it. Go live and love like him. And please say an Our Father for me, et benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et fili, et spiritus sancti, descendit super vos, et maniat semper. Amen.